You are tuned into the Dr. Tina Show with Dr. Tina Moore. For more, visit drtina.com. On this episode of the Dr. Tina Show, I'm going solo and I'm talking today about my absolute favorite topic, muscle as medicine. As many of you well know, I am a huge proponent of strength training for longevity, strength training for life, strength training to survive this crazy zombie apocalypse nonsense we found ourselves in. And I cannot, absolutely cannot emphasize enough how critically non-negotiable and important strength training is for you to live a long and healthy life. And I'm going to tell you why on this episode. Let's jump in. If you followed me for any amount of time, maybe you're like OG follower from way back in 2015 when I started out online, or maybe you're new to me, you know that the entire time I've been talking about strength training. In fact, it's one of the main reasons I went online in the first place was because there was really nobody talking about strength training in the format of how medicinally and critical it was. It's, you know, we talk about it for aesthetic reasons. We talk about it, you know, we hear from strength and conditioning coaches and bodybuilders and all kinds of really intelligent people in terms of weight loss or in terms of aesthetics or in terms of competition. But at the end of the day, I just want to not break a hip. And once I got into strength training and I noticed how massively improved I felt overall, my pain, my mindset, my endurance, my sex life, everything was so much better. And I couldn't, I just couldn't believe it. I started researching, of course. I do what I always do, which was dive into the literature and start looking. And boy, have I dug up some information for you. So I'm going to share with you now just the overview, the grand overview. I'm not going to get too hung up in the weeds on studies here, but I'm going to share with you kind of the main quick and dirty of why strength training is non-negotiable and it's particularly non-negotiable in 2023. If you hang around and listen to this episode, I believe I will convince you and I'll get you to understand why it's utterly critical that you start some kind of journey into strength training. And to make it easier on you, I finally got my together and put together a program after long loss, lots of people asking, hundreds of people asking me over the years saying, Dr. Tina, would you please, please put together some kind of strength training program, some kind of video or DVD or online course. And I am so happy to announce that I have finally done it. I have launched an account on a private exclusive platform that you can access via the show notes and you too can follow along with me on my strength training journey. I want to preface this by saying this is perfect for you if you are at any level. So do not be intimidated. The whole point of it was because I didn't feel comfortable just throwing exercise videos up on Instagram and calling it good. The reason being is a lot of people ended up in my office over the years because of just following along with some Instagram influencer and not having any proper modifications. My background is not just being a meathead strength training geek, but I actually have a pretty decent background in rehabilitation, Pilates. I actually have a board certification in physical therapy for the chiropractic practic board. So it, no, I'm not a PT. I'm a chiropractor, but I we did a whole standalone board examination and training in physical therapy and rehab. So I know what I'm talking about in the fact that I can get people moving. Now, if you're an elite athlete and you're just looking for workouts, probably not going to be that much fun for you. You probably could come up with something more exciting. But for those of you, the normal person on the street of any age, whether you're a teenager or you're 95 years old, I want to invite you to click the link in the show notes and consider signing up for my exclusive platform. It's only 20 bucks a month, you guys, which I think is an incredible value. And I'm going to be in there giving you all kinds of great information Right now, I've got a tutorial up on how to deadlift. I've got a whole shoulder rehab series of exercises that you can use if you've hurt your shoulder to get you going and get you moving and past the pain. I've got an entire video on Hormones 101 in there so you understand how important hormones are to the whole picture. I've got a long form video on what to do with frozen shoulder, like what I 
specifically would share with my patients what I did for myself when I've had shoulder injuries. I've never had, knock on wood, I've never had frozen shoulder, but it's really the quick and dirty of how your hormones impact your shoulder, et cetera. So anyway, it's a huge value. It's inside. We're going to be ramping it up here this, you know, in the new year. So I'm trying to get everybody in before the new year and come January, 2023, there's going to be two workouts a week, plus tons and tons more opportunity to connect with me in there. I actually answer my DMs in there and it's a place to access me, get further clarification, et cetera. And then I'm going to be focusing on modifications for almost every exercise as best we can. I want to teach you the most joint friendly way to do things. And I want to teach you about things that probably you might be doing that are hurting your joints and you don't know. And a lot of people don't know. So I'm going to be sharing with you what I know. No, I'm not a strength and conditioning coach. No, no, this was not, you know, the end all be all of my practice, but I did have a huge gym in my practice. If you ever came into my old clinics and I helped people rehab, I helped people get moving and I helped people learn how to squat properly and how to deadlift properly and how to do these movements because these are the movements you're going to do in your day to day. This isn't about, yeah, it's nice to have a nice butt, right? It looks nice. It carries a pair of jeans. Well, I'm not going to complain there, but it really is more important that I can pick up my dog and put her in the car because she can't get up that high into the SUV. And I'm able to help my dad, you know, my elderly father fell down and was unable to get up himself. And I was able to get behind him into a squat position and use the fulcrum of my body weight, push him up and get him up. And I don't think, I don't, it's not that I don't think, I know neither my daughter nor my mother could have gotten him up. So these are helpful skill sets to have and not only helpful, but critical because if you don't have your muscle mass and you're walking into any kind of illness period, whether it be something more chronic like cancer or something more acute like COVID, you need muscle mass to survive, period. It's not negotiable. It's not up for discussion. Frailty is the number one, in my opinion, and from all the data I've looked at, frailty is the kiss of death. It's the number one reason people do poorly with any outcome is if they walk into it frail. So we don't want to walk into anything frail. Now, what is frailty? Frailty is muscle wasting. If you're not actively building muscle and eating high quality protein, you are dealing with impending frailty. So if you're older, your body goes into sarcopenia, meaning muscle wasting. It just does that naturally as a process of aging because we low grade get inflammation creeping up as we age and we have a shift in our hormones. And so we start to lose muscle pretty quickly, starting in our 30s really. And it ramps up significantly when we get into older age. So unless you're actively combating it, you are dealing with frailty. And I see a lot of teenagers that are frail because they never built muscle mass in the first place because of our modern society and video games. And I see lots of men dealing with frailty because they never, ever got into athletics. They never did any sports. They never put any kind of muscle on their body when they were younger. So now they're in their adult years and they might be a young adult, women too, dealing with older adults traditionally older adult onset disease processes. And really all they are is, in my opinion, it's not a mystery. It's sarcopenia. They've got lack of muscle mass. And because they have lack of muscle mass, they're now dealing with all kinds of metabolic dysfunction, maybe fatty liver, maybe high cholesterol, maybe even high blood pressure at a young age. And it's often very much due to lack of muscle mass. Now, of course, there's confounding factors there. There's dietary interventions, there's mineral depletion, et cetera. There's co-infections. There's all kinds of things. Yes, there's trauma, there's adverse childhood events. There's all kinds of things that lead to disease processes. But I'm telling you, walking into any situation with a slab of muscle on your meat suit is going to help you not only get through the situation better, but you're going to have much better outcomes coming out the tail end. I firmly believe and I stand behind every word I say. I firmly believe as somebody who endured long haulers disease processes following a very bad viral infection when I was 19. We called it post-viral syndrome. Doctors didn't believe us, but now long haulers with COVID is all the rage. I firmly believe it has to do with frailty and it has to do with inflammation secondary to frailty. Those folks going into this, now some might have gone into it and gotten long COVID and they were well-muscled. So I'm going to punt back to metabolic health here as well. 
but it's all one big thing. It, here's the deal. If you don't have adequate muscle mass on your body, you can't have a healthy metabolism. If you don't have a healthy metabolism, you don't have a healthy immune system. If you don't have a healthy immune system, you can't fight something off completely. So yes, it's it's a multitude of things, but large, you know, by and large, the folks that I've seen dealing with long COVID, whether it's on the internet and I look at their photos or it's, you know, they show their before and after, or it's in real life, all of these folks have been, went into it with some level of frailty. If they were decently muscled, they usually had a shitty diet. So they went into it with inflammation, but 99.9% .9 of them were frail. Now you might say, but Dr. Tina, I'm obese. How can I be frail? Absolutely. In fact, the inflammatory process going on with the obesity is driving frailty, meaning the fat cells themselves secrete a ton of inflammatory cytokines and those inflammatory cytokines are going to induce frailty and muscle wasting as a consequence. Same thing happens as we age. The inflammaging, it's called inflammaging, it's a term, of aging, the process of becoming more inflamed as we age and becoming more metabolically, a little bit of metabolic dysfunction starts to happen slow grade and we become more carbohydrate intolerant. All of those things lead to an induced rate of muscle wasting or sarcopenia. So unless you're actively combating it, lifting weights two to three times a week, you are not winning the battle against frailty. And if you walk into any circumstance in a frail state, you are in loads more trouble. And the reason I went through that 19 years old girl got cytomegalovirus and got knocked down with it for a decade was because I was so frail. I was at the peak of my anorexia. I was at the peak of my eating disorder and I was severely malnourished and underweight. And had I not been cytomegalo, I can't talk, tongue twister, cytomegalovirus is a virus that hits everybody and is usually very benign and not even noticed. Most people don't even know that they got it or went through it. It's devastating to those who are in an immunocompromised state. And I was so immunocompromised, they thought I had HIV. And that was back when HIV tests took forever. So they tested me and I was like, oh my God, I spent weeks thinking I had AIDS or HIV. And it turns out I just had a very, very nasty case of cytomegalovirus, which I endured for a long time. And I didn't get any help until I met my mentor, Rick Marinelli. And he was a naturopathic physician. And he was like, you need to lift weights. And boy, I didn't listen <laughs> I did not listen to him. You know, when I started training, I figured it out. When I started actively putting muscle on my body, I was around 40 years old and Rick was dying of cancer. And I'm going to cry. <laughs> I know myself. And when I'm dealing with severe stress or in particular grief, I waste away. And I didn't want to waste away. So I started training for his death, you guys. It makes me so sad to think about. I started actively training because I knew my best friend was going to die soon. And I didn't want to waste away because my practice was going well and I was a single mom and I had to take care of my daughter and I needed to not fall apart. And so I started actively training so that I could handle what was coming next. I sure did get skinny after he died and I spent a long time very thin, but at least I was thin with muscle and not just thin and catching every cold that came around. So I get it. I know we're all in different places. I know some of us have a lot of hesitancy to even start. We don't know where to start and you should be hesitant because it's a skill set that you have to learn. You can't just pick this these weights up and start flinging them around and hoping for good things. You'll either A, hurt yourself, which is really common, and then you won't do anything or you'll plateau. Every beginner gets really good gains and it's very exciting and it sucks when all of a sudden your body gets acclimated to the strength training and you plateau. And when you plateau, you might give up then too. That happens frequently as well. So I've created this program inside my exclusive platform so that you don't get bored, you don't get hurt, and you don't plateau. We're going to go through this together. And on a personal note, I've had a rough year. I have... In 2021, if you guys have followed me for any amount of time, in 2021, I had a really bad flare of low back pain and it was devastating. I finally got myself through that and was on the path back and to strength and I was doing really well in my workouts. And then all of a sudden last summer, I had a very severe Achilles tear. It was almost a full rupture and it was horrible and I could not even walk for God knows how long, but I did not boot it and I did not have surgery. I just rehabbed it. And I want to share with you how I did that inside this portal. 
But I got my Achilles back online. And right as my Achilles was starting to feel better, I injured my my shoulder. <laughs> so I was like, great, I can't lift my lower body. I can't lift on my upper body. But, you know, we get through it. And so I came out all, and I was also enduring severe stress during that time. We had some deaths in the family. My daughter was going through quite a bit. I was dealing with stuff professionally. And it all caught me. And at the end of, I can say honestly, at the end of 2022, I have no ass. My butt is gone, you guys. Like, it's not a flat pancake by any means, but I worked so hard to build such a beautiful, strong booty. And I have reasons for that that I'll do, I'll talk on another podcast about. I really believe that the glutes are the gateway to your vitality. The better the set of glutes, the better your health in general. And my butt just disappeared. So I'm right there with you. And that is why this is exciting that for 2023, we are going to do this together. I joke with my coach. I call them my little granny workouts. I'm doing these little granny workouts. And I want to invite you along with me because we are going to go slow and low and we are going to build up a tremendous amount of strength. And in that process, we're going to learn control of our bodies. We're going to learn tensioning of our bodies. We're going to learn how to do it so it's super effective. You don't need big heavy weights, but you do need some weights. And I talk all about what you need inside of the portal. And yeah, it's awesome. It's going to be awesome. And I'm going to build back with you. So 2023 is the year that I am gunning for hot and healthy and happy. I just want to be hot and happy and optimally healthy. And I can't do that without adequate muscles. I'm taking you along for the ride. And I really hope you'll consider giving it a go. The first 20 people that sign up with the link in the show notes is going to get a huge discount. And I hope you'll come check it out and see for yourself that this is not a gimmick we're building from the ground up and I'm super excited to have you along. There's lots of folks in there already and they are all kinds of age ranges. It's so fun. I'm getting messages from people in their 70s and you know early 80s and all the way down into their 20s and everybody's really stoked to be there. So new year, we're getting strong. We're growing our asses and we're shrinking our waists and we're going to have a great time doing it. Okay, so I am going to jump in quickly and share with you about why muscle is medicine. And this is really me making a case for muscle as a mitochondrial biogenesis depot. I am trying to, at the end of the day, you need your mitochondria working for you. And to not complicate things too much, I'll keep it simple. I'm not going to give you the medical version that I give when I speak at conferences, but I am going to share with you, I'm going to go fast and it might be a little sciencey, so hang on. So there are some hallmarks of aging. One of them is that we have a reduction in our pluripotent stem cells. So our stem cells actually go to sleep. They become senescent. If you're obese and inflamed, they become quiescent, which means they are dead. And in some studies in mice, they were unable to be turned back on. And I don't know how, if they had extended those studies out further, if that would have changed things, but it's, that's pretty bad news, you guys. So we don't want asleep or zombie or dead stem cells. We want active stem cells. And that's a hallmark of aging is you start to lose them. That's why you don't heal as well. That's why things don't turn around as quickly. We get oxidative stress and cell death. So just straight up, like I said, as we age, we start to get more and more inflamed, more and more carb resistant, more and more insulin resistant, and we lose our insulin sensitivity. And that can all lead to a bad, you know, bad health of our cells and cell death. So this is most often caused by chronic inflammation and increased adiposity. So as we age, we get more inflamed. Usually it's because people are eating sh- diets, to be honest, lots of seed oils and garbage and refined carbohydrates, but also they start to get fatty infiltrate into their skeletal muscle because they're not training their muscle and they start to get increased visceral fat. All of that is a vicious cycle that perpetuates itself and goes round and round and round. And the end result is sarcopenia. The end result is muscle wasting and fatty infiltrate of your skeletal muscles. So your muscles don't even work as well. And that fatty infiltrate in and of itself is inflammatory from the inside. So now you've got marbled fat or marbled muscle, I should say, and that fat is inflaming it from the inside. It's a disaster and it causes the muscle itself to waste. Bad, bad news. And then ultimately you get mitochondrial dysfunction as the end result. So to keep our mitochondria happy, we need healthy muscle mass. That's it. Sarcopenia is the term that I've been using. It actually means poverty of the flesh. And my friend at one point was like, 
we should start a heavy metal band and call it Poverty of Flesh. But this process of sarcopenia begins for most people, like I said, in their 30s and 40s, loss of up to 8% up until their, what, 70 years of age. After that, it increases to 15% per decade. That's crazy. We had these stats back in the 80s. I don't know why people aren't talking about them. On that note, I really think muscle mass is a vital sign. You know, you go to the doctor, they take your blood pressure, they take your pulse, they, you know, they check your weight sometimes. I think muscle mass is absolutely a vital sign and it should be assessed. If I always wrote my chart notes, if somebody was well muscled or not, or if they were dealing with sarcopenia. Frailty, like I said, is the kiss of death. So this sarcopenia, this poverty of flesh, this process leads to an increased incidence of, get this guys, all the things that modern Americans are dealing with, insulin resistance, hormonal imbalances, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, which is imbalanced, you know, you've heard about your lipids being off, your cholesterol, your LDL, all that, high blood pressure, heart disease, and then increased further deposition of fat. So you lose muscle, muscle eats fat, the more muscle you lose, the fatter you get because you got nothing fighting it. You have nothing keeping your metabolism revving, right? The main causes of sarcopenia are aging, deconditioning, lack of proper strength training, right? If people do exercise, they generally lean towards chronic cardio, like running and biking and walking and yoga as their main forms, and none of which really build lean muscle skeletal mass very effectively. So that's not good. Or they're also under eating protein, or they're making poor food choices or eating low quality protein. And think about this. Most elderly folks that you know, are they getting adequate protein? No. Here's the caveat. The older you get, the harder it is for your stomach lining to actually start absorbing or make enough stomach acid to break down your food so that you can absorb it further down the line in your small intestine. All of that starts to atrophy just like everything else as we age. So that atrophy process leads to certain chemicals not being secreted throughout your digestive tract, which are also necessary for digestion and absorption of those nutrients. And this perpetuates and potentiates lack of proper muscle deposition on your body because you're not really breaking down your proteins adequately. But also it's compounded by the fact that as folks age, they eat less and less protein. They might be living alone because they've lost a partner. They might, it's no fun to eat alone. I get it. I've lived, I lived alone for a long time. They might be sad or depressed or isolated or lonely, that will lead to low appetite. They might have dentition problems in their teeth as they get older. And so chewing is hard. And sadly enough, which I think is going to be a huge issue right now, since we're headlong into a recession is cost. They're often on a fixed income and they're unable to afford good quality, high protein foods. So it's a disaster, I know. And Oddly enough, the older you get, the more protein you need to consume to get the same about a, same amount of muscle synthesis. So that's even worse, right? We add everything I just said to the picture of like, hey, now instead of one gram per pound of body weight, you might need to eat more just to get the same amount of muscle protection or even muscle synthesis, right? So it's sad. It really breaks my heart. And I want to encourage those of you who interact with your elderly parents or you interact with elders at all, they're really such a critical part to our society and we've discarded them highly and I want them all strength training, but I want them all eating well. So support them if you can. Have a meal with them, sit down, have a meal with them, talk to them, get the, help them get their appetites back so that they can start eating more high quality protein. So some more causes of sarcopenia, physiologic anorexia of aging in older adults. So that kind of goes back to everything I just said. They And they really do start to lose their appetites for various reasons. Muscle wasting is perpetuated by declines in hormonal output and increases in inflammation, which begets more muscle wasting and more inflammation. And it's just the vicious cycle there. And then, like I said, loneliness and depression can play a role, particularly as people become more isolated, which we've had such a huge disaster of with this stupid pandemic. The amount of isolation that has occurred is, to me, above all, maybe the most criminal action that was imparted on society. It's I know that this, (laughs) there are some studies coming out about the vaccine, yo. It is not good. 
basically, and I'll put the link of the study in the show notes. Okay, so mitochondrial dysfunction and sarcopenia of aging is, it's a thing. We've got data on it. We've got data on it going going back. This is not new information. I've got a study here in front of me from 2013. You guys can you guys can do your own research, but trust me, we want our mitochondria functioning so that everything else functions. The pathogenesis of sarcopenia is multifaceted and it encompasses lifestyle habits, systemic factors like chronic inflammation and hormonal alterations, local environment perturbations like vascular dysfunction, and intramuscular specific processes. So uh, sarcopenia is multifaceted and it ultimately leads to destruction of mitochondria. You can try to rejuvenate your mitochondria in your body. Those are the powerhouses of your cells, by the way. I don't want to get into a long discussion of like why mitochondria are so critical. Just trust me. If you're all your mitochondria in your body died right now, you would be dead in like half a second. They are what generate the energy for the cell. They're bacterial. Isn't that cool? They're symbiotic bacteria, you guys. Can you believe? I learned that when I was 19 in undergrad and I was like, what? We've got bacteria living in our cells symbiotically that are generating all of the power. It's freaking awesome. Anyway, you can see why some antibiotics in particular can and glyphosate can wreak huge havoc on our bodies because in some capacity, they are killing off our mitochondria because our mitochondria are bacterial. So anything we do that's antibacterial might have an impact on our mitochondria. And I think most humans at this point are dealing with mitochondrial dysfunction more than anything. And what does muscle do? do you, name me another organ you can build. You can regenerate your liver over time, but there's no way to actively regenerate your liver. You, you literally can lift weights and build muscle. And muscle is an organ system. You can build a bigger organ system, which means more mitochondria. I don't know any other way to put more mitochondria on your body, right? Or in your body. You can generate mitochondria by adding more muscle and more muscle cells. And the more muscle we have, the more mitochondria we have. It's so cool. The other thing is mitochondria, I'm sorry, muscle cells have GLUT4 receptors on them. GLUT4 receptors suck up all that excess blood sugar and do something with it and utilize it. So you're literally building an anti-diabetic slab on your body. You're building a mop. Think of it as a mop. It's a blood sugar mop. You're mopping up all your blood sugar by lifting weights and adding muscle. And you're putting more mitochondria on the scene. It's so cool. And you're helping the poor little sick mitochondria you have do a better job. It's win-win. The other thing muscle does is it secretes myokines. So you know the dreaded cytokine storm of COVID and everyone's like, oh my God, the cytokine storm. And the cytokine storm really is the the of the whole thing because once that starts, you can't turn it off. Like doctors cannot turn off the cytokine. Nobody can turn off the cytokine storm. That is your own body going ape shit and turning on itself and melting you from the inside. It's not good. That's really where COVID gets out of hand is if it gets to that phase. Now that phase is not reserved for everyone. I do not have an immune system that goes completely bonkers. I have a pretty well-regulated immune system because I have plenty of muscle mass on my body. I could use more, of course, always, but I have a decent amount. I don't get the dreaded cytokine storm nearly as badly as like, say in the past, I have dealt with low-grade cytokine storms with other illnesses and they're terrible. Or I've dealt with, a, I should say, a pretty severe inflammatory phase of other upper respiratory illnesses in the past. And I learned quickly, I got to build some muscle. So myokines, back to myokines. In well-trained skeletal muscle, your muscle secretes basically the same molecules, interleukin-6, et cetera. But instead of the, guess where cytokines come from? Fat cells. The cytokines coming out of fat cells are pro-inflammatory. The same molecules coming out of muscle cells are anti-inflammatory. So when you build muscle, you're literally building a suit of anti-inflammation on your body. You're building a suit of GLUT4 receptors to mop up all that excess blood sugar that's floating around, and you're building a suit of mitochondria. I can't think of anything else that comes even close to that. There's no pill. There's no medication. There's nothing that comes even close to that level of overall improved health and wellness for a mammal than putting muscle on your body. 
So in this scenario that I just mentioned of that kind of the pathogenesis process of sarcopenia of like lifestyle habits, systemic factors, local environment, intramuscular specific processes, these derangements in skeletal myocyte mitochondrial function are recognized as major factors contributing to the age-dependent muscle degeneration. So we do not want that process, guys. We want to be fighting it. We want to fight, fight, fight. And the only way to fight is to put a slab of muscle on your meat suit. So you know what the mitochondria are. They're the powerhouses of our cells. They, we need them to su- survive. That's pretty much it. Without them, they're done. They're actually matriarchal in where they come from. And they came, they were passed down, from what we understand, they were passed down from a woman in Africa. That's the lineage. Your mitochondria are descendants of an African woman's way long time ago ancestors mitochondria. It's pretty crazy. And mitochondria basically photosynthesize, if you ask me. We've got, we've, they're much like chloroplasts in plants and they need sun. They need infrared light. They need all kinds of input. So this is why we do red light. This is why we do infrared sauna. It's not just to structure our water. It's not just to turn on our heat shock proteins. It's to really nurture and love on our mitochondria. And the same process happens when you go out in the sun. So think about your mitochondria as photosynthesizers, if you will. They both evolved very similarly, the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. And if you know biology, you know the chloroplasts are what photosynthesize sun into nutrients for the plant. Okay, so there's several causes of mitochondrial dysfunction that we're exposed to all the time in the world. We've got oxidative stress, we've got lipopolysaccharides, we've got heavy metal toxicity, mold, lime, we've got all kinds of environmental exposures of toxins. I mean, the world is a toxic soup bucket. It's a disaster. I mean, it truly is just the poor earth has turned into such a toxic environment. We're getting sprayed with glyphosate on our food. We're getting chemtrails in the sky. We've got massive pharmaceutical use. All of these things really do just a whopping number on your poor mitochondria and they don't feel good. And the symptoms you'll get when your mitochondria start to dysfunction, and this can happen at a very young age, Fatigue, weakness, slowed cognition, so brain fog, depression, anxiety, difficulty breathing, premature aging, chronic disease, and cancer. And I believe truly that all of this can be contributed to the ongoing process of lack of muscle mass and sarcopenia that happens as we go along. So this is why we strength train. Mitochondrial dysfunction is a major contributor to sarcopenia and therefore aging, but sarcopenia is a major contributor to mitochondrial dysfunction. You see the problem? Resistance training has been shown to stimulate myofibular and muscle mitochondrial synthesis, as well as activation of signaling proteins. This is all so critical to our overall health. Mitochondrial impairment normally seen with inactivity has been shown to reverse with resistance training. We have the data on it. This is from a study that was done in 2008. And resistance training has also been shown to reverse the aging process at the phenotypic level. So if any of you know anyone who started strength training, you'll notice they look younger and younger and younger. That's the ticket, right? that's because they're having an improvement in their mitochondrial function. It's a big deal. There was another study I'm looking at here from 2020 called The Role of Age-Related Mitochondrial Dysfunction in Sarcopenia. And the abstract showed that skeletal muscle aging is associated with a significant loss of skeletal muscle strength and power, muscle mass, and quality of life. Quality of life, you guys. This phenomenon is known as sarcopenia. This condition affects nearly one third of the older population and is one of the main factors leading to negative health outcomes in geriatric patients. I would say it's impacting a lot more than that. Notwithstanding, the exact mechanisms responsible for sarcopenia are not fully understood. Mitochondria have emerged as one of the central regulators of sarcopenia. In fact, there's a wide consensus on the assumption that the loss of mitochondrial integrity in your muscle cells is the main factor leading to muscle degeneration. So hopefully this has made an argument for you to understand that to have health, we need mitochondria. To have healthy stem cells, we need mitochondria. To have energy and output, we need mitochondria. And one of the most critical destroyers of our mitochondria is muscle degeneration. And one of the biggest contributors to muscle degeneration is sickly mitochondria. 
That's really the argument I'm trying to make here. I will make a mention of something because I often get accused of fat shaming. And while the obese far outweigh the underweight, I will say again, back to my frailty spiel, a very thin frail person is looking at a tough go if they get sick with something, anything, whether it be again, acute illnesses due to upper respiratory infections or something like cancer. If I'm going to go into cancer, I, we have the data and I'm not going to beat this one over the head, but trust me, we have the data. You do not want to walk into cancer frail. You want to walk in with as much muscle mass as you have. We have data showing that if you, the more muscle ha- mass you have, the less likely you are to get any illness and the less likely you are to have terrible outcomes with cancer. Conversely, the more muscle mass people had who did have cancer, particularly there was one study in breast cancer, those who strength trained regularly and had muscle mass did far better, had far better outcomes. So we're we're training for life. We're training so that whatever may come, we can handle it. And I'll say about COVID, you know, that's a wasting disease. A lot of these upper respiratory viruses are wasting diseases. And when you're wasting away very quickly because of the pro-inflammatory nature of these viruses, what they induce in you. And boy, after I got done with COVID, that was the bummer, right? I had COVID in October, 2021, October, November, end of October early November. And I woke up from it, you know, I'm five days down with the fever. I come out of it and my butt is gone. And I was like, well, because I had worked so hard to get that booty because I had suffered so much from chronic low, low back pain in 2021. And like, I just kind of come out of the pain in May. I'd gotten my butt back, got COVID, butt gone. Then I spent early 2022 building that butt back up. Got my muscle put back on and then boom, all this stress in the late summer, but gone. So this is why we are on this adventure together inside my exclusive portal, which I hope you'll sign up for. Again, 20 bucks. It's the cost of a cup of coffee a week. And I'm going to teach you so much and you guys are going to have such great outcomes because it's not just about doing the exercises. I want you to know why you're doing them. I want you to know how to do them safely. I want you to know what to do when something hurts and how to modify it. And I want you to be able to be doing this type of strength training for the rest of your days. It's a joint friendly way of putting a lot of good quality years on your life. So let's talk about TOFI. Thin on the outside, fat on the inside. These are the skinny fat, usually girls, but I see this in men too. I should say women, uh, not girls, but I see this in women and I see this in men. Even in young women, I see this. I think BMI appears to really underestimate obesity. What is thin on the outside, fat on the inside. It's where you can still fit in the same pair of jeans that you fit into in high school, except you don't have any muscle mass. You just have bone and fat. And those poor folks, the skinny on the thin on the outside, fat on the inside folks, that's what I was. That's why I started strength training. And man, those folks have a significantly increased risk of death from all causes. So the risk of mortality significantly goes up when you're thin on the outside, fat on the inside, even much more so than their obese counterparts. So if you're skinny fat and your husband is obese fat and you guys walk into COVID, you might very well have a worse time. So don't just be like, oh, hey, you know, it's the, it's the obese people. It's not. And that's why I get so frustrated when people accuse me of fat shaming because I'm talking about the different factors that contribute to inflammation, which contribute to poor outcomes with COVID. Generally speaking, fat is going to be far more pro-inflammatory than anything else in your body. Your bones and your muscle are not pro-inflammatory if they're in a good, healthy state, but your fat sure is. And so if you have more fat on your body, of course, you're probably going to have worse outcomes. But if you don't have any muscle and all you have is fat and bone and you look seemingly thin to the you know outside viewer, then tough times. And this is where I see a lot of people getting confused. In the early days of COVID, I was constantly getting pushback from people saying, well, you know, my friend was very fit or my friend was very healthy. And I'm like, what's your definition of healthy? Because I don't think my definition and your definition are the same. (laughs) You know, like, I don't think we're talking about the same definition of, of healthy because they might just be looking at someone and think, well, this person looks thin and they equate that with health. And I'm telling you, that's incorrect. Or they might look at somebody who is obese and say they're not healthy. And now, generally speaking, that's more accurate, to be honest with you, because obesity will undoubtedly do its thing over time. I don't 
we can go around in circles about this health at every size hypothesis, but it is a hypothesis for one. And two, eventually those folks' metabolic health will start to tank out. I've seen it time and time again. I've seen very healthy on lab work and, you know, generally speaking, women and men in their 20s, they've got excess weight on them. They're fine until homeostasis quits working and they're not fine in their 30s or 40s or some of the earlier signs will be infertility. And then they get to their 40s and 50s and the wheels really start falling off the car. So you just can't, and even your poor joints, I mean, the weight on the joints is definitely going to take its toll over the decades. So my point being is when people say, well, so-and-so was healthy and they got sick or they died, of course, we're all going to we're all going to catch, we're all going to be exposed, right? And some of us will fall ill and others won't, but how much muscle mass you have really determines your metabolic health and your metabolic health really determines your immune system health and all of those tie together like BFFs. So ultimately, let's go back to the root here and say, somebody's not really healthy unless they have good skeletal muscle mass on them. So just by looking at somebody, I can tell because I'm trained. I can look at you. I don't care what size you are. I don't care if you're 250 pounds or you're 100 pounds. I know exactly how well-muscled you are just by glancing at you, but I'm trained to do it and I've been looking for it for a long time. For those of you just looking at your family members thinking, well, I'm just so surprised so-and-so was so sick with whatever. I thought they were healthy. I'm like, well, are they vegan and are they skinny fat? Because like that's a disaster, waiting to happen, right? In in my opinion, and from what I've seen clinically and from the literature. So anyway, there was a study done in 2011, really interesting, looking at leptin and C-reactive protein and interleukin-6 in young women of differing levels of lean and fat mass. And what they found was even in young women that BMI appears to underestimate obesity, while BMI classified some young women as normal weight, When body fat percentage was measured by DEXA, which is my favorite way to measure your muscle mass and your your fat mass, there was a significant discrepancy. So BMI was garbage. DEXA was the thing. BMI showed only about a 32% of being overweight or obese, while DEXA showed 47% as being obese. So it was not the BMI, which is your basically a measurement of your height to your weight. It was the DEXA looking at fat mass and lean muscle mass in the body. Biomarkers like leptin, C-reactive protein, and interleukin-6, those are all markers of inflammation and metabolic dysfunction, were significantly higher in the DEXA-identified obese group. Really fascinating stuff. And then there's just so many metabolic effects of sarcopenia. You get a decrease in your metabolic rate, your resting metabolic rate. You get a second, that's secondary to a decrease in lean muscle mass, subsequent decrease in overall physical activity. And this all leads to frailty because people stop moving. So their muscle starts to waste and they, you know, compound that with inflammation and aging and metabolic dysfunction and hormones dropping and mitochondrial dysfunction. And you have the kiss of death. You have old age frailty syndrome and it's a disaster. So we don't want, we don't want to see this in our loved ones. We don't want to see this in ourselves. I think another huge factor that is often overlooked, and I probably should do a whole episode on osteoporosis, but you guys have heard me say that osteoporosis is diabetes of the bone and I'm not wrong, but it is definitely a metabolic dysfunction happening because of metabolic metabolic dysfunction in the body. But it's also a major, major repercussion of low muscle mass. And so this loss of type 2 muscle fibers and the process of osteoporosis occur nearly simultaneously. As we get that fatty infiltrate in the muscle that I mentioned, we get an increase in inflammation because fat is pro-inflammatory and that starts to impact the bone. And so we start to see bone loss because your joints, your muscles, and your bones are like BFFs. They're a triad. Whatever happens to one happens to all. So if you've got osteoarthritis, I guarantee you, you have osteoporosis brewing. And you definitely have metabolic syndrome issues going on or starting. They all go together. And then you have, you're going to have sarcopenia on top of that. Elderly adults who suffer from bone muscle unit loss of 50%, while the quality of the bones also deteriorates. It's the bones and the muscles are BFFs. It's a self-perpetuating cycle, like I said. And the only way out is to start strength training and eating more adequate, healthy protein. I prefer animal protein. I prefer beef. I think that actually chicken and seafood are kind of subpar protein sources. I'm a big fan of red meat, ruminant animals, and strength training. 
So what happens then as the bone and the muscle start to deteriorate, get inflamed, get marbled, is you start to get a diminished sense of balance and gait speed with the loss of muscle. So they, these folks slow down. They start walking slowly, which slows down their cognition and leads to all kinds of problems, but also the balance piece is huge. And that fatty muscle is no longer able to respond quickly and adapt like it should in the presence of a scenario where like you got to catch yourself or you step off a curb wrong. And that's where we end up with hip fractures. It's because of fatty marbled muscle. It's because of sarcopenia. So don't look at your frail elderly little parents and say, oh, they're thin, so they're okay. No, they're not. And in fact, they might be in more danger, at least when someone's walking around with obesity and excess adiposity on their body, that weight acts as a weight, which does actually have some improvement sometimes for muscle and bone health. Like these, the obese folks might actually have very decent bones. That is not always true because if that adipose tissue is secreting a ton of inflammatory cytokines, it will totally waste the bone and muscle too. So like I said, those folks deal with a lot of frailty as well underneath all that fat. But I'm just saying, we don't want our hips to break. It doesn't matter what size we are. We want muscle. We got to quit looking at weight loss as a, oh, you know, calories in, calories out. It's an eating issue or lack of eating or eating too much or whatever. Like, yeah, that's a player. But So is your inflammation, so is your hormones, and most notably, so is your level of skeletal muscle mass. And nutritional deficiencies contribute to both osteoporosis and muscle wasting. Falls and fractures in the elderly are attributable to this loss of skeletal muscle mass. So the hip usually fractures before the fall takes place. I don't know if you guys know that. A lot of people don't realize that. The hip will usually break before the fall, and then all of a sudden they step wrong, and boom, it's all over. And it's because these folks are so malnourished and probably rocking some low-grade or high-grade inflammation. Sarcopenia has been shown to increase the risk of falls by up to one and a half to threefold. I mean, that's just terrible. So regardless of bone mineral density, the degree of fatty infiltration in muscles has been found to increase the risk of hip fractures. We don't want to be breaking a hip, folks. That's people who break their hips die or they lead a very terrible existence afterwards. The amount of bone and its architecture are determined by the mechanical forces that act on the skeleton and those mechanical forces are muscle. So we, the forces we put on our bones is how we keep our bone health intact and in balance. Again, another argument to strength train. There are links between mitochondrial damage and dysfunction and osteoporosis. We have that in the data. And then we have what's called osteosarcopenic obesity syndrome. This is uh, the hallmark of sarcopenia is this fatty infiltration where the muscle fibers are replaced by adipose tissue. This fatty intramuscular infiltration significantly decreases torque production of the muscle and is associated with increased risk for future mobility loss, i.e. hip fractures. Loss of lean muscle tissue, strength, and mobility are all critical factors in aging, and we have to look at them. This is a triad of bone, muscle, and adipose tissue impairment, and it's been recently coined osteosarcopenic obesity syndrome. I talked about this at the beginning of COVID, and people blew me off. (laughs) And here we are. Breaking a hip is the kiss of death, right? In women, there is a five-fold increased risk for all-cause mortality during the first three months post-fracture. And while men... It was eight-fold increase, you guys, over the same time period. So the first three months following the fracture, your chances of dying if you're a woman is five-fold increased and eight-fold increased for men. This excess mortality persisted after hip fracture at each time interval. And they looked at one year, two years, five years, and 10 years. It's just crazy. At over two years post-fracture, the relative increase for all-cause mortality or death was about two and a half times and twofold for men and women, respectively. So even two over two years out, you still have a two and a half time greater risk of dying compared to the control population. And this ratio was sustained for up to 10 years. This is crazy stats. And what's the solution? Strength train, strength train now. Start now. I don't care how old you are. Start now. It's going to be harder to put on muscle mass the older we get. It doesn't matter. You still have to put on something. You have to do it. Like that's what I'm trying to get at. There's no way out of this. That's This is why exactly why I tell you strength training is non-negotiable. If you've gotten this far in the podcast, you've heard me say it a hundred times. Strength training is non-negotiable. So we know that it decreases inflammation 
We know that it helps improve metabolic health overall. We know that it helps your endocrine system, so your hormones. It helps really balance out your hormones. We know it helps your mitochondria, which does all of the above. We know it secretes all kinds of helpful factors that are good for your brain, that are good for your body, that are good for your immune system. Your muscle is alive and well. It's an organ system and we can build it and we can nurture it. And that makes it pretty awesome. So I hope that this was convincing to you that strength training has got to get implemented. It's it's non-negotiable and it's really the quickest ticket to being harder to kill. That's ultimately the goal, right? We want to take really good care of ourselves, but 99% of the time when someone drops into my DMs or they're in my comments or they email me and they're like, Dr. Tina, I'm doing everything, which I, who knows what everything is. I'm doing everything right and I'm not losing weight or I'm not getting better or whatever it is, you know, insert whatever into this line. I ask, are you strength training? And 99% of the time they say, no, not yet. And I'm like, oh, hear me now. I have said this repeatedly. If you are on the journey to health, I don't care what you do to get started. But I think the first starting point should be to start strength training before you change your diet, before you take all the pills, before you do anything, you should start strength training. And here's why. Because when you strength train, you automatically start making better food choices because you just worked so hard to build that beautiful muscle that you really, really want to take advantage of it. And so you feed it well. You want to strength train because it will make you thirsty. And so you'll start to naturally hydrate yourself better. You want to strength train because it will wear your body out in a good way and it will help you sleep and sleep is everything. So if you're not sleeping, you're not recovering, you're not going to build muscle. But if you're not wearing yourself out, you can't sleep well, right? There's so many good reasons why strength training is the first place. So I I get messages from people and, and they've told me like, God, I lost 100 pounds since I started following you, which is so cool. And they show me their before and afters and it's awesome. But their afters, they're just like frail, skinny people. And I'm proud that they dropped the fat. But I said, did you, are you strength training? And they say no. And I'm like, oh, you know, I want to smack my head. I've said it repeatedly start with the strength training everything else will fall into place that way and you will be harder to kill and you will have a better time getting through the winter and everything that comes after and the improvements in your health start immediately when you start doing it right when you put in the work it will immediately start to show up and you will start to make better choices across the board plus I can't emphasize enough the impact it has on your mental health and on your ability to persevere and hold the line and be strong. My strong will that you see, my seemingly fearlessness has very much to do with the fact that I train several times a week. And it's my Wonder Woman time. It's my warrior strength time. And it gives me the ability to persevere against the trolls and the negativity and everything else that comes my way. I'm like, you know what? It. I can deadlift more than they can their point is moot. (laughs) So I want to encourage you, especially you women out there, getting strong is the best thing you can do for just, just about every part of your mental, emotional health. I, I, it will translate. I've had women start strength training and message me and say, I had the strength to leave. I listened to you. I started strength training and I finally had the strength to leave my husband of however many years because he's, I've been in an abusive relationship I've had people tell me, you know, I started strength training and I finally went to my boss and got that raise I deserved. I started strength training and I felt confident enough to launch my own business. And your success, so I coach a lot of health professionals in how to build a thriving online business and get out of the brick and mortar and get out of the grind. And I will tell you that the folks who strength train in there are more successful than the folks who don't. And I've coached a lot of doctors, hundreds at this point. The folks who strength train across the board are significantly more successful than the folks who don't because it translates. That strength that you're getting physically translates into a mental strength and, and endurance that I and resistance and resilience that I, I just can't uh, emphasize enough. So I hope that is helpful. I hope this takes you into the new year with inspiration. And I highly encourage you to click the link below and get started and join me inside my private platform and we will get to work. Thanks for listening to the Dr. Tina show. 
Please be sure to follow me on Instagram at Dr. Tina, that's D-R-T-Y-N-A, and Dr. Tina 2.0, as well as visit my website at drtina.com. This is a Resonant Media production produced by Drake Peterson and mixed by Chris McCone. The theme song is by John the Gilt. As always, you can email the show at podcast at drtina.com. And if you like this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. See you next week. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. It does not constitute the practices of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. I am a doctor, but I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is intended not to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Do you suffer from IBS or other digestive issues? Are you looking for a new podcast to listen to? From the producer of The Dr. Tina Show comes the all-new health and nutrition podcast, Digest This, hosted by Bethany Ugardi. You may know Bethany as the face of the popular Instagram page, Lil Sipper, or you may have even read her book. Now you can find her wherever you get your podcasts. On Digest This, Bethany examines topics such as gut health, nutrition, the food industry, and highlights specific ingredients that can be beneficial or harmful to your gut health. She also explores non-toxic options in beauty, home, and cooking essentials. If it has to do with your health, Digest This is talking about it. Each episode features an interview with health experts, doctors, and wellness advocates and delivers you information that is, well, easy to digest. Bethany also delivers a weekly segment every episode called Bite of Knowledge, where she highlights an ingredient commonly used in food, skin care, household cleaning, you name it, and gives you the lowdown on the benefits or dangers that ingredient might have in your everyday life. From Botox, potassium, olive oil, and magnesium, all the way to those ingredients you can barely pronounce on the back of your cereal boxes, Bethany has you covered. There's a reason why it debuted at number two on Apple Podcast Nutrition Charts, Check out Digest This on your favorite podcast app. New episodes every Monday and Wednesday. Produced by Drake Peterson and Resonant Media.